Nowadays, a lot of smartphone appliances and devices we see all around us call themselves smart and AI powered. What does it really mean? Every single one of these smart devices learns through algorithms and the large amount of trained and annotated data that has been fed to it. Algorithms are simply the set of rules that are programmed in the machine on which it operates. In fact, all of these smart assistants like Alexa, Siri, Google Assistant can recognize your speech and come up with a specific answer to your specific questions. This is happening after observing your usage patterns and behaviors using an artificial neural network, which is very much similar to a neural network present in the human brains. In fact, the very first artificial neurons design is based on a human neuron's basic structure. That is why neurons are at the core of the learning and thinking process, be it in humans or machines. Hi, my name is Kshitish Patan and welcome to Easy Data. In 1943, a logician and a neurophysiologist came together to put forth an idea of an artificial neuron. The great minds of logician Walter Pitts and neurophysiologist Warren McCulloch published a paper titled A Logical Calculus of the Ideas Imminent in the Nervous Activity. It's quite a mouthful. In this, they demonstrated the first mathematical model of neural networks. Commonly referred to as the McCulloch Pitts neuron, this model mimics the functionality of a biological neuron. It demonstrates how a mental process like learning takes place with the help of neural connections. It's important to notice at this time that Pitts had not received a university degree when he came up with the idea of an artificial neuron. In fact, he wasn't even an official student. He educated himself by assisting many science scholars such as Rudolf Carnap and Warren McCulloch himself. The only degree he later received was an Associates of Arts degree offered by the University of Chicago for this very work with McCulloch as an unofficial student. The model works on Boolean logic that uses the AND, OR, NOT, XOR and XNOT functions. What is Boolean logic? Well, don't worry, we are planning to make a separate video for this. Right now, all you need to remember is that it's a system where there are two inputs and one outputs and depending upon which one of these inputs is on or off, determines what the output is going to be. Anyway, during these times, devices could only perform commands and did not store any kind of data or results for future predictions. And although this original model was limited to two types of inputs, it was an important step towards what came next. Later, in 1949, a Canadian psychologist named Donald Hebb theorized about the synaptic connections in a human's neuron, completely separate from all the things that were going in AI at that time. It was the first time when a psychological learning rule for synaptic change in neuron was introduced that came to be known as the Hebb's synapse. His theory explained how a neuron can strengthen a learning pattern into a learned behavior or habit when it performs the same task again and again or develops a sustainable thought pattern for a very long time. Essentially, he theorized that our brain cells are just like us. They need to do a task repeatedly in a fixed or a mixed pattern in order to learn something. McCulloch and Pitts later developed a cell assembly theory in their 1951 paper and their model was then known as Hebbian theory, which was very much based on Hebb's previous discovery. Any machine learning model that followed this idea was said to exhibit a Hebbian learning. This theory served as a watershed moment for research in the field of machine learning. By 1950, more serious effort in this field started to take root. To examine whether a machine can generate answers like humans, the British mathematician Alan Turing, yes, the one from the imitation game played by Benedict Cumberbatch, came up with a Turing test.
Alan Turing was a mathematician and computer scientist from London who made an important contribution to machine learning. Turing is already well known for his work during World War II when he updated the Polish machine bomb that more effectively decoded the complex coded messages sent by Germans to their spies in England. Post-war, he continued to develop his ideas about computer science and published a paper titled Computing Machinery and Intelligence. This paper proposed the idea of the imitation game, which later became the Turing test. A simple test of examining if a machine can think like humans. Alan Turing believed that in about 50 years time, it will be possible to program computers with a storage capacity of around 109 megabytes to make them play the imitation game so well that an average interrogator will not have more than 70% chance of making the right identification between a computer and a human response. And wouldn't you know it, by 2014, a chatbot named Eugene Koosman passed the Turing test by convincing 33% of the jury members that he was a 17-year-old Ukrainian boy and not a machine. Further, in 1951, a cognitive and computer scientist named Marvin Minsky started to work on his idea of creating a learning machine. This machine is considered one of the first pioneering attempts in the field of artificial intelligence. As a student, Marvin Minsky dreamt of creating a machine that could learn. He wanted to better understand intelligence by recreating it. But the machine he imagined had many technical requirements that were very expensive and needed funding. To build his device, Minsky secured fundings from the Harvard psychologist George Miller. Therefore, with the help of fellow Princeton graduate Dean Edmonds, he created the first artificial neural network called SNARK or Stochastic Neural Analog Reinforcement Calculator. The design included 50 random interconnected neurons that were inspired with the Hebbian learning. The main aim was to make the system learn through possessing past memory. To make this happen, Minsky and Edmonds tested its learning capabilities by having the machine navigate a virtual maze. Now that's because a maze problem has multiple solutions or routes that can take us successfully to the exit. But the best way is the one that takes the least amount of time. Therefore, the neurons in SNAP were trained randomly to solve the maze. Every result that gave more information to the neurons about which move was probably correct and which one was probably wrong. Thus, eventually realizing the best route by training itself on multiple combinations, neurons developed a pattern and studied their own pattern to come out with the best case solution. Typically, computers were trained to solve solution-based problems. But to achieve the next level, we needed computers to solve strategic problems. The best way to train them was to teach them to play games. As games are very much strategic in nature and the kind of thinking that was considered beneficial as it would give a structure to solve other strategic problems. This was believed by a computer scientist, Arthur Samuel, who created a computer program that played the checkers game. Arthur Lee Samuel was an American pioneer in the field of computer gaming and artificial intelligence. He created the world's first self-learning program that played the checkers game on its own. He chose this game as it was simple and gave him the opportunity to focus more on learning patterns. While he was working at IBM, he developed this program by implementing the first alpha-beta pruning algorithm. This algorithm uses the search tree method and minimax strategy. Until now, computers had gathered the capability to store data and predict output. But since it was 1957, they were almost about to learn how to see when an American psychologist named Frank Rosenblatt designed the perceptron. Perceptron is a neural network compound of a single artificial neuron. It was designed with biological principles after being inspired by the concept of the Mackellar pitts neuron and the Hebbian theory. This machine was designed for image recognition. The artificial neuron in a perceptron had a number of inputs where each input had a weight associated with it. So, the total input a neuron gets will be the weighted sum of all of the inputs and its weighted sum exceeds the threshold value the neuron will fire. New York Times reported, the perceptron is the embryo of an electronic computer that will eventually walk, talk, see, write, 
reproduce itself and be conscious of its own existence well it does feel a bit too much but again is it really that different from what we see in newspapers nowadays anyway this model was based on binary classification which means it could distinguish between two classes however it functioned under the linear classification but failed in non-linear one this limitation of perceptron brings us into the next stage of machine learning history where marvin minsky <coughs> enters the picture once again he identified the loopholes in perceptron that essentially led to the ai winter ai winter was a phase when almost all research was stopped as marvin minsky criticized rosenblatt's perceptron in his 1969 book titled perceptrons an introduction to computational geometry it was quite discouraging for the industry to say the least adding on to it was the failure in fulfilling the hyperbolic expectations made by the ai industry thus far this prompted the investors and government bodies to withdraw funding leading to ai winter that lasted from 1974 to the 1980s then in 1986 a cognitive psychologist and computer scientist jeffrey hinton came as a savior he provided a solution to the perceptron problem bringing in a renaissance in the industry Hinton co-authored a paper titled Learning Representations by Backpropagating Errors in which he disproved Minsky's criticism of the Rosenblatt's perceptron. He proposed that if a group of perceptrons is combined in a neural system with hidden layers, a perceptron can perform classification under a non-linear function. Any mathematical function can be converged in this manner. As a result, the AI industry changed dramatically. A critical flaw in Rosenblatt's perceptron was suddenly fixed, resulting in a boom in AI. Further in 1989, Jan Minkin, regarded as the father of convolutional neural networks, created a device that could recognize handwritten digits. This device annotated zip codes by looking at the images of written digits and employing a neural network with a back propagation algorithm. This stood as a landmark achievement in computer vision. Later on, experimenting with gaming was still carried out to make the machines better in making strategic solutions. Chess was yet another game that computers were taught to play, and this was also the first time in 1997 that a computer triumphed over a human. Feng Shui Shu, a graduate student, was working on his dissertation project, Chip Test. He was creating a machine that could play chess. Later when he started working with IBM researchers, he continued to develop this chess playing game with his associate researcher and the deep blue scientists. To teach the machine various chess moves, this team gained the support of US chess master Joel Benjamin. Joel assisted the machine by compiling a list of moves that the machine could use during the game. He also played against the machine so that the team could identify its flaws. However, When this machine played its first game against world chess champion Garry Kasparov in 1996, it got defeated by 2 points. The team went back to the drawing board and worked on improving the machine's ability and created a new version of Deep Blue that could consider a staggering 200 million options per second. Finally, in 1997, IBM's Deep Blue computer defeated world chess champion Garry Kasparov. It was during this time when the importance of data for machine learning was realized by few researchers. While many of the 21st century researchers focused on machine learning models, in 2006, a computer scientist from America, Fee Fei Li, prioritized working on data sets. She believed that data could change the way we thought about models. As a result, around 2009, she devised the concept of ImageNet. ImageNet is a dataset of images organized for its use in visual object recognition. Today, it offers approximately 15 million labeled images in 22,000 categories. This project was inspired by two important needs in computer vision. Firstly, the growing demand for high quality object categorization and secondly, the critical need for good resources to conduct good research. This initiative by Fei Fei Li It did many deep learning and neural network researches by providing them with the labeled image datasets that they so desperately need. 
This annotation of large amounts of data sets was carried out with the help of crowdsourcing by using Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Since then, the ImageNet project has held an annual software contest called the ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge. The goal is to develop models that could perform the best on this dataset or simply identify objects with the lowest error rate. In 2012, Jeffrey Hinton and his team competed in this ImageNet challenge. They reduced the error rate to nearly half to that of the previous year's competition winners. So what did they do to warrant such a huge leap? Well, they used GPU hardware with a deep learning algorithm. This resulted in better ImageNet performance. Following this great victory, many researchers began to work in this field. Companies such as Apple, Amazon and Facebook became more interested in this technology and an ecosystem began to form. Initially working to create accurate roadmaps by extracting data from satellites and street views, in 2009, Google started working on self-driving technology after the success of Anthony Lewandowski's self-driving car, Revo, which was featured in Discovery Channel's show Prototype This. This project was later renamed as Waymo and went on to become a startup. In 2016, they were acquired by Google and are now a part of Alphabet. The DeepMind company, which was acquired by Google in 2014, developed an artificial Go player, a machine that defeated world champion Lee Sudol in Go, a game that is far more complex than chess. The victory of DeepMind's AlphaGo urged many scholars and thinkers to consider the use of artificial intelligence in various fields. Its presence and operations on our daily lives made us wonder if machines can really think. During this time, a filmmaker named Oscar Sharp created a short film named Sunspray that is written by an AI system. In a future with mass unemployment, young people are forced to sell blood. Okay, I didn't say it was good, but the modem that created the screenplay used text prediction technology that we see today in smartphone. Another technology like IBM Watson can be seen as a chatbot in many service provider applications where it acts as a virtual assistant. It is a question answering machine that generates insights from large amounts of unstructured data using natural language processing and machine learning. Now, along with thinking, the other question was whether these machines could get creative. And guess what? That too was attempted when computer scientist Ian Goodfellow introduced GAN, Generative Adversarial Network, in 2014. It is a learning model that learns and discovers patterns from inputs, resulting in a new set of updates. The model can create a new set of artworks by combining two different images. Also, the very recent invention developed by OpenAI could create images with textual descriptions. It is a type of prompt engineering. I'm sure you must have seen at least a couple of images developed by this AI program named DALI 2. It is capable of creating images of real as well as fictional objects. The image that you see in front of your eyes is the result of the text prompt a dolphin in an astronaut suit on Saturn. It's quite fun. DALI illustrates how imaginative humans and clever systems can collaborate to create new things thereby increasing our creative potential. But it looks like this is just the beginning. Because on 29th September 2022, Meta just announced their prompt-based video generation tool called Make a Video. A little on the nose, but I guess it's alright. Right alongside other similar independent or open projects like Synthesis.io and Rephrase.ai. The main question here is, is AI really thinking? The short answer is no. The current state of AI is the same as any other use of computation. It does what humans ask it to do, and humans need to be very specific about what they ask for. Every good AI model out there is really good at only one thing, meaning that the AI that draws your drawing does not order your birthday cake just because your mom forgot to. But yes, the future is exciting, and we would love to be on the ride. That's it from us today. Be sure to comment, like and subscribe and we definitely hope to see you around again. Bye-bye.